Okay. Thank you all for coming today. This is really interesting to hear about all these families. And it's so hard for us to imagine in the lives that we live now what it must have been like for these people to sell out everything that they own and pick up their families and generation after generation travel to into the wilderness not knowing what was going to wait for them. And I especially have a lot of admiration and love for these people that they've been able to do that. And it's exciting to uh, learn about their adventures. Um, I'm a descendant of Benjamin Ely. Um, he's my great, great grandfather. I'm named after his daughter, Nancy Sophronia, who was my great grandmother. Um, and this, I wanted to point out that you know he's a Yolo County pioneer. And as you'll see in my presentation, um, there's been generations of exploration, innovation, and agriculture. It's been really important in their lives. Before I get started, I just wanted to point out a couple of people in the audience. I wanted to uh, acknowledge my our partner, farming partner, Tony Turkovich, and his wife, Joni. And, <laughs> and my husband, Bill Young, whose family is the historical family in Winters. I've been able to trace our family back to 1705 and the birth of um, Isaac Ely. Um, there's conflicting information as to whether he was born in England or Scotland. The family story says that Isaac immigrated to the colonies with three brothers and settled in Virginia. Again, we all kind of started at the same place. Uh, he was a member of the military of Virginia, and in 1762, he received a grant of 294 acres of land in the Royal Colony of Virginia from Lord Fairfax. In his will, he named Benjamin Ely, and this is not our Benjamin Ely from Yolo County, uh, but Benjamin's grandfather. As you'll see, we kind of use the same names a lot. Um, you're named after your ancestors. Um, and Benjamin was his only son. He willed his wife Sarah one-third of his estate and one-third and fifty pounds to only son Benjamin, and the rest to grandson William, provided he stayed on the premises. And here they are floating across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, I, when I did my presentation, I wanted to include uh, some of the historical information for you to see that I didn't want to have to talk about. But you'll also see in future slides all of the um, children from these families. Benjamin Ely, uh, who was Isaac's son, at an early age came to the colonies with his parents. About 1777, he fought in the Revolutionary War in the 4th Regiment. He accompanied Daniel Boone across the mountains into Kentucky. Um, that was a wilderness area. And around 1792, he moved to Bourbon County, Kentucky. And my daughter and I, my daughter lived in Kentucky for two years, and we looked it up today to see where Bourbon County was, and it's just um, east of uh, Lexington. In 1818, he moved to Missouri in an area that is now Rawls County. Now, Thomas Ely is Benjamin's son. Benjamin's son, Thomas, was a native of Virginia but moved with his parents to Kentucky at an early age. In 1816, he married Margaret Howard, and Margaret's father fought in the Revolutionary War until the surrender of Cornwallis. In 1818, which is very early, he accompanied his parents, he took his wife and two children, uh, and Thomas Ely moved to Missouri and settled in Rawls County, and they became a pioneer also of that state. At that time, few white men uh, migrated west of the Mississippi, and uh, Indians frequently called on the family and showed up at their cabin, and at one time, the Indians showed it up with furs and beads and wanted to trade for their little boy, wanted to make a trade for their little son. <laughs> um, as a rule, the Indians were friendly, so the family had little to fear. Thomas was a farmer by occupation, now we're in Missouri, um, and he engaged in raising mules, sheep, and cattle, and also owned slaves who was, uh, assisted him in the cultivation of the land. He passed away in 1837 at the age of 47. 
And I haven't been able to find out um, exactly why he passed away at an early age. Um, most of the, my ancestors lived long lives, and so this was very unusual. So after 20 years of widowhood, during which time she managed the home farm, in 1857, Mar Mrs. Margaret Ely sold her place in Rawls County, set her slaves free, and accompanied her son Benjamin, who's our Benjamin, to California. Uh, she made her home in Yolo County with her daughter, Mrs. Joseph Griffin, and uh, in whose home she passed away at age, uh, in 1874 at the age of 84 years. So we've heard about Rawls County so many times when talking about our ancestors and where Benjamin Ely came from. Um, so I looked up some information about um, this county. Uh, I thought you'd like to know a little bit about the area. Rawls County is located on the west bank of the Mississippi River north of St. Louis and was also called Little Dixie because the area was settled by migrants from the upper south, especially Kentucky and uh, Tennessee. They brought slave-holding traditions with them and quickly started cultivating crops like hemp and tobacco. They also brought antebellum architecture and culture. And that's probably why the Griffins build that beautiful southern-style house. I actually visited with my dad in 1980 to the last re relative we had back there. And oh, it, did it's you? Not, if you know, yeah, and Perry, which is the area where they were in, although not necessarily in that New town. New London, too. I hear New London, too. New London is yeah. right near there. It's not very far from Hannibal. So if people will know where Hannibal is, it's only about 30 miles from Hannibal. Yeah. And this is the courthouse in New London, and I have... Um, found the, um, the list of items owned by Thomas Ely um, when he passed away, and it talks about how Benjamin goes to the courthouse and tries to settle his estate in this, this mm -hmm. building. So here's my great-great-grandpa, Benjamin Ely. Uh, the first trip Mr. Ely made to California was not long after the discovery of, am I in the right place yet? Yeah, the discovery of gold. <coughs> On April 15, 1850, he started for the Golden West with ox teams and arrived in Placerville on August 26. Uh, after mining on the American River for two weeks, he became ill. When he recovered, he worked at any occupation that offered a livelihood. Discouraged by a lack of success in mining, he turned his attention to other businesses. He went to work in Sacramento and contracted out to uh, cut wood for $9 a cord. He earned some money by making hay, and with the assistance of his brother-in-law, George Myers, stacked a large amount of it, but it was ruined by high water. After he accumulated $5,000, he returned to Missouri in November of 1851 by way of the Isthmus, which took 45 days. And evidently, he kept a promise to his wife to be back by November. <laughs> <laughs> um, back in Missouri, he settled down with farming and raising mules. He intended to remain in Missouri, but California was attracting thousands of permanent settlers, and he decided to follow the tide of immigration. He sold out, and in 1857 came again to California. He had um, six children, and a wife, and a farm, and a home, and he, they just sold mm -hmm. everything and just left everything to fate. You have, you have so much admiration and awe in people to be able to do that. So he sold out. Um, he sent his family, um, Margaret Howard, wife Elizabeth, and six children by way of Panama. The Ben Ely and Joe Griffin wagon train left Center, Missouri on May 22nd, 1857. The train consisted of 50 people, 300 to 400 cattle, and 50 to 60 horses and mules. The route followed the Platte River to Fort Kearney, then 300 miles to Fort Laramie and through the Black Hills. During the trip, he had serious trouble with the Indians. Twice, he had hard-fought battles and was wounded in his hand. He carried that scar the rest of his life. Another wagon train that had left Missouri two weeks earlier was also attacked, but in this group, every person was massacred with the exception of one woman and her brother. So the luck of good timing was with them. 
The worst part of their trip was crossing 47 miles of desert burning sand in two days and one night via the Truckee River, uh, Truckee Canyon route. So evidently two days and one night, they probably went all day and so you can imagine how exhausted <coughs> they were by the time they finally arrived. After six months of travel, they finally reached the Carson Valley in Nevada, where they found out that they had started too late in the season and the mountain pass leading into the Sacramento Valley was blocked with snow. So they disbanded and spent the winter in the Carson Valley in Nevada. Buckeye. Benjamin and his family settled six miles north of where Winters is now located. He had 1,600 acres of choice agricultural land. He farmed 3,560 acres with an average yield of 25 bushels to the acre. Again, we're doing the dry farming. Mr. Ely also had 80 acres of foothill land planted in choice fruit trees and vines. Um, Tony helped me uh, look, find all the properties on these old maps. So we had always known that he had property in the Buckeye area, but he also had some property east of Winters and then also up into the foothills there. The Ely place was properly known as Buckeye. Benjamin donated all the land for the town site. The post office of Buckeye was on his ranch, and President Lincoln appointed Mr. Ely postmaster in 1864. <coughs> he held the office for 10 years. He had a large, handsome, and finely furnished home that was erected in 1869. So that was a little after your family's uh, home was built, right? Actually, a little before. A little before? Um, the interior was splendidly decorated in great part by the artistic hand of his daughter, Georgia Elizabeth, oh, Georgia Elizabeth who was an excellent painter. <coughs> also, Georgia never uh, married, and she uh, lived with her mom and dad until you know, her mother died. Um, in the 1870s, with the building of the railroad and the subsequent development of winters, <coughs> The town of Buckeye was moved away and the land reverted to grain fields. The Ely home, unfortunately, was demolished in 1948. Beautiful Victorian home. Here's the family. Um, they had 10 children. So this is the, and this is my great grandmother, Nancy Sophronia. And then, um, Ben and Elizabeth. Right somewhere, I think I missed somewhere something here. Ben and Elizabeth, um, when she was 17, he was 20, um, they eloped on horseback to get married. Um, their, neither of their parents wanted them to get married, so they eloped. She's holding on behind him at the back of him and took off and got married. And uh, they had to stay away for two years. And finally, after two years, I guess their parents <laughs> forgave them. And they came back to Rawls Town. <laughs> and their marriage lasted 60 years. <laughs> uh, according to historical records, Benjamin Ely was a man of great character. Uh, his habits were exemplary. Not only did he refrain from the use of alcohol, but he also refused tobacco in any form. Mr. Ely was generous and accommodating almost to a fault. When asked to endorse notes or loan money, it seemed impossible for him to refuse. And it makes me think of telling people there was no banks. He should have started a bank. Um, his wife was described as tender, gentle, cheerful, and noble. Besides raising 10 children of her own, she opened her heart and home to five orphans whom Mr. Ely brought in at different times. One was a little girl he carried uh, on his horse over 100 miles, and another an Indian boy for whom he traded a load of grain. Very generous, warm family. In fact, uh, their nicknames were Uncle Ben and Aunt Betty. That's what everyone called them. Here's the family, the entire family, um, for their 60th wedding anniversary. And down here you can see Ben, and there's uh, Aunt Betty, Elizabeth. And this was just a few months before Benjamin passed away. That's uh, your grandfather right in the front, the two-year-old. This one? No, over. Keep going. Right there. That's your that grandpa. one it is? That is your father. 
My father? Yes. No. no grandfather. Grand, grandfather. 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 I didn't know that. Yeah. I know you ran that picture in the yeah. Express. <laughs> I, but I, it's not clear enough that you can tell where everybody is or who everybody is. Um, so here we are, the family gathered at the Buckeye home for Benjamin and Elizabeth's 60th wedding anniversary. All the children were present except their son, Ben. Most of the grandchildren and great-grandchildren were also there. The feature of the day was a fine, old-fashioned Sunday family dinner. After being in feeble health for several years, uh, Benjamin died April 16, 1901. His generosity won him many friends. His funeral was the largest ever known in Yolo County. People from all over the area attended. There were 90 carriages in the procession and not less than 600 people at the funeral. He left to each of his 10 children 160 acres without encumbrance of indebtedness. Most of these acres are still held by his descendants. Okay, Henry Leslie Button um, married uh, Benjamin's daughter, Nancy Sophronia, that I pointed out earlier. And here we've got the mule teams, which I think are awesome. Um, Henry Leslie came to California in 1876, and he located first in San Luis Obispo, where he worked on a farm. In 1878, he came to Yolo County. For two years, he worked on ranches in this area. And in 1880, he purchased a team of eight mules, rented 320 acres, and began farming on his own. So he came with nothing, and with two, within two years, he was an independent contractor farming with his own uh, mules and harvester. He gradually increased his acreage until he leased as much as 1,600 acres, upon which he raised grain. He also, his other interests, he was a stockholder in the Woodland Creamery Company. He was progressive, and the ranch was equipped with labor-saving machinery, including a modern Haynes Hauser combined thresher that was operated by 32 mules. How long do you think it took to hook all those mules up to in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> you know, mules aren't always cooperative either. And um, here are their portraits. Henry Leslie, who went by Les, and Nancy Sophronia, my great-grandmother, um, Froni, Evie Button. Um, I have in my home uh, portraits that were taken later in their lives that used to hang in my father's office, and now they hang in our bedroom, and I look at them every day. Talk to them. <laughs> okay, um, this is my grandfather, Robert Lee Button, and my dad, Robert Leslie Button. Uh, Les and Froney, their son Robert Lee Button is my grandfather. Uh, he began farming upon graduation from high school, raising livestock and cultivating barley, wheat, rice, and alfalfa. The land he cultivated was part of the original Benjamin Ely homestead, and he worked 400 acres. He'd been on the same piece of property since 1857. Um, he retired from active farming in 1948, and his son, my dad, Robert Leslie Button, began operating the ranch. Another interesting thing about my grandpa is that he used to uh, be a water witcher. You know, take the stick and <laughs> walk around, and he was kind of famous for that. And this is my grandfather, my grandma and grandpa Button, as I remember them. And... Um, an interesting thing about my grandmother is she prepared and fed the new new meal to all the farm hands during the harvest season. She also she was cooking for all these guys that would come in and eat. And I remember she made great biscuits. And mm -hmm. Grandma and Grandpa always had their main meal at noon. And we all lived on the ranch together. And my brother and I would always be out running around, and we'd always kind of show up at Grandma and Grandpa's house at lunchtime because we knew that. Good dinner. <coughs> uh, this is their home. Um, my grandfather built this home in 1913. It sits on the ranch and currently serves as the headquarters of the Button and Turkovich farming operation. So it's over 100 years old, 102 years old. Um, nearby, over this way, um, there's a large granite uh, rock <coughs> boulder 
with a plaque marking the location of the original community of Buckeye, and that is right there. This is my father. Bob Button was an agribusinessman in the Winters area and instrumental in developing the mechanical tomato harvester. Uh, he grew up on the Buckeye Ranch that is his, his family had owned and farmed since 1850s. He attended Buckeye School, which we saw a nice, I'd love to have that, a picture of that or a copy of that picture of the school. Um, and then went to Winters Joint Union High School and the University of California at Davis. He was intent on studying engineering. Unfortunately, his father needed him back on the ranch and he was not able to complete his education. My dad had a lifelong love of flying and enlisted in the United States Army Air Force in January 1944. And here you can see he has a little model plane. He used to love to build model planes and he loved airplanes. Um, he received his private pilot's license and purchased his first private plane in 1957. He continued his flight training and earned his instructor, instrument, and commercial pilot's licenses. At one time, he owned three airplanes. <laughs> Bob married a woodland girl, Martha Susan Willis, my mom, who's still living. She's going to be 87 this summer. Uh, they were married on March 12, 1949. Bob and Martha built a new home in 1955 in the same spot once occupied by the original Ely Mansion. The oak trees that were in the front yard of the Ely Mansion uh, now grow in the backyard of the Button home. They raised four children on the home ranch. Me, my brother Bob, who lives here in Winters, Sally and Mary, and then Bob's grandson Benjamin Button lives in the uh, Button home on the ranch now with his family. So his children are the seventh generation. Bob farmed 3,000 acres devoted to row and orchard crops. In 1959, he purchased 180 acres west of Winters and developed 120 acres into an apricot orchard. It was the largest single planting in the history of Winters and also the first time tree spacing was marked by tractor, which previously had been done by hand. He planted the upper portion of the property in navel oranges that still stand today. And everybody waits for the button oranges. <laughs> they are the sweetest. Uh, he tried new methods and techniques and utilized agricultural research to improve farm production. He designed one of the first mechanical tomato harvesters and worked with University of California researchers to develop varieties of tomatoes that could be harvested mechanically. I remember my dad sitting in his, uh, at his desk in his home office with the big drafting paper and the T-square and the triangle and the drafting tools and designing the mechanical tomato harvester. With the help of his mechanic, Merle Rogers, he built the prototype button tomato harvester in the ranch shop. The harvester went into the fields in September 19, 20, 1961. With the addition of bins and later gondolas, the tomato industry was changed forever. And in this picture, it's really tiny, but you can see um, Merle Rogers, who was the mechanic that helped build, uh, helped Dad build it. And here is John Griffin, George's father, and then some of his winter's friends, I'm um, woodland friends, um, Bob Garner, Herb Sharp, my dad's the tall guy, Bob Button, and uh, Pinky Pinkston, Boy Dale Pinkston. Mm -hmm. And their creation is behind them there. Johnson Farm Machinery of Woodland manufactured the harvester, and Dad traveled throughout California and as far as away as Yugoslavia to assist farmers in the field who had purchased his harvester. And I remember him always going out to go help people to get it so they're successful with it. Johnson produced the harvester for 37 years. Uh, CTM of Crow's Landing, California, continues to produce the harvester. And the original harvester, this one here, um, has been repainted and cleaned up and preserved, mm -hmm. and it's now at the Hydric Ag Museum in Woodland. Mm -hmm. A plane crash claimed my dad's life on December 3rd, 1975. 
The crash occurred between Davis and Dixon when Dad and his mechanic tried to maneuver the single engine plane back to the Yellow County Airport after discovering fuel pressure problems. In 1973, Bob had hired Tony Turkovich to help him manage the farm operation and Dad mentored Tony until his sudden death. Tony and the Button family then partnered to form the Button and Turkovich farming operation, mm -hmm. and Tony's son Michael is now also a partner. And they carry forward a legacy of innovative and sustainable farming and a stewardship of the land. I wanted to thank you for your interest in all these pioneer families that have settled the Buckeye, Buckeye area. And I'd especially like to thank Joanne for her support in uh, providing a few photos, especially of Benjamin Neely. Mm -hmm and to Tony for helping me with historical maps and photos in the ranch office. And to Bob, he also hooked me up with Bob Koontz, and I was able to go over and get um, some photos from his house here. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? Oh, any <coughs> Who put all the ranch back together? Is that, is that your father? Put the ranch back. Well, there's all these acreage and all these kids, and all of a sudden now it's back into one family. Well, no, it's still, uh, well, our, our 160 acres, we still own. Um, we still own that. Um, but it was all, you know, part But partial. around you, yeah. so other We people. farm a lot of that. Tony, you can maybe answer some of that. Um, well, I know we farm a lot. Was, was together, and then we've, we've expanded. Yeah. Well, the original, original land, is that owned by the Button Turkovich? No. Is that owned by no. Other no. People? Oh, okay. other so people. The, some other people. The 160 some, acres where our home ranch is now, where the office is, and where my mom and dad's house, and where yeah. the old uh, old Ely house was, that has been in our in our my family, our family, um, since 1857. The land all around it was a bit large parcel, and 160 acre parcels were given to the children when he came, when he died when he, uh, Benjamin Ely passed away. And most of that is still owned by descendants of, of, the, of the families that inherited that on his death. But we do farm a number of those, a number of those acres. They're owned by other people. That's classic. Yeah. Joanne, do you have a well, I historical had, note? I had the opportunity to interview uh, Martha Button in 1982 at, about the, uh, the harvester, the development of that particularly. But at that time, she told me that um, all of that uh, acreage that was given to the ten children, that only two of them had ever been sold out right. of the family at that time. I don't know if that's true today, but I think that's rather remarkable yeah. that they've been able to hold that parcel of land <laughs> within that family. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Jen. I want to make a couple of closing uh, comments. Just for somebody who's been in a family that, I mean, we're not tied to the land or anything like that and moved around all over the place, it, it's just amazing to me that longevity in a certain area that, that these families have exhibited, the, the hardships that they went through to to keep the, these properties in their families. And I'm sure that many of you have thought the same thing in terms of decisions. You know, like that one little decision of going back in, to Missouri and marrying somebody, and then, you know, generations down the road, here you are talking about it. It's just <laughs> absolutely amazing how little decisions in your family along the way have uh, shaped who you are. Uh, a couple other things. Again, we've got a hat back there for donations. We definitely want to thank the Barry S. Gap folks for uh, partnering with us and lending us this facility. I think it worked out real great. Uh, I knew it was going to be a little cozy, and, and it worked out great. Joanne, is there anything else that you want me to? I don't think so, but thank you for everyone coming. Yeah, thank you all. And uh, be looking. We've got at least one more, I think along the Buckeye presentation coming up one of these days. Mm -hmm. it, uh, I don't know when it's going to be, but well, we're still working which, on it. Do you know which families are going to be presenting? Well, I know Briggs is one of them. Yes, yes. Uh, and then I don't know. Briggs, we've talked 
about doing the um, Graf family, mm -hmm. which goes mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. pretty far. Right. Technically, Buckeye Township, as of 1875, included all of southwestern Yellow County, so we could do this forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much for attending, and uh, appreciate it. Thank you for your tech, tech help. I actually taught a couple of your sisters. Oh, you did? Yeah. Sally Mary? No.